Well, good morning. It's so nice to hear all these conversations and things going on and people talking and with one another. It's, it's, just, it's just great. So we're just glad you're all here today. Welcome to the Lord's house this morning. I don't know about you, when you go through, uh, you know, since we live out south of town here, across the, across the river, we're on the other side in Hawaii County, but just our, my commute about anywhere I go, I get to go through farmland. And, you know, this time of year, it is, it's such a, a great reminder of spring and the canals are full and the crops are starting to get watered already. And just the newness of life and all the buds uh, coming up. And it's just such a great reminder to me of, of, of the newness of life and what Christ brings each year, but to us as well. I'd like to read a, a, just a short devotional uh, from uh, William Barclay this morning. It's called Proportion. Alan Walker in Everybody's Calvary tells of a young minister in a little country village church. He'd invited the congregation to wait after the service for a celebration of the sacrament. Only two people waited. He thought of canceling the whole service, but he went on. As he went through the ancient ritual, he came to the passage, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. He stopped. The wonder of it gripped him. Angels and archangels and all of the company of heaven. God forgive me, he said. I did not know I was in that company. If we could see the world against the background of eternity, if we could see in the light of the cross, if we could see in the presence of God or if that is asking too much, if we could see it simply against the background of human tragedy, of human sorrow, and human broken hearts, we could get back to the true perspective. We could recover a sense of proportion. Trifles with a big T would be seen as trifles with a little T. God would come first. Other things could take their proper place. Before we have a prayer this morning to start us off, our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 51, verses 7 through 12. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Rejoice to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Let's be in a spirit of prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, as we come into your house this morning, quiet our hearts and minds and put away the things that have maybe troubled or caused us um, periods of just being away from you. Lord, help us just to put all those things away this morning as we come into your presence. Lord, we know that uh, we're not only in your presence in this place, Lord, but we just pray a special quietness over us this morning in our hearts that we may just come to you, receive your message this morning. May it just make us anew like the new buds on trees and flowers and the greenness of spring. Lord, help us to be refreshed by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. We're going to sing a love song today. Thank you, Jim, for that 
opening it just fits right in with my thoughts that i keep falling in love with him not just your guy next to you but with our lord and this he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by isn't that the way it is let's stand this is a peppy song kind of get get your mood going here not too dancey but a little you know <laughs> a wiggle maybe not a whole dance just a wiggle twice through I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go oh what a love between my Lord and I I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again i keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again i keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again he gets sweet oh and a love between my lord and i i keep falling in with him over and over and over and over again. Thank you. You may be seated. You guys want to come up? You can. You Boy, I asked them if they wanted to come up, and they went, oh. <laughs> it's good today. No, it's all right. He can listen from there. So, today, we're, what do you guys think we're going to talk about today? Did you read, huh? Psalm 51, yeah. What does David want God to do for him in Psalm 51? He wants joy to come back. Now, it's interesting because Psalm 51, that's a psalm that David, he's kind of in trouble in that psalm. He's not done some good things. He's done some bad things. And he recognizes that, and he's feeling pretty bad about it, and he's praying to God in the psalm to return the joy. He says, you know, I've done some pretty bad stuff. I need you to clean me. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to make me well. I need you to give me a good heart. Now, the nice thing is that God does that for us, that when we have bad things happen in our lives, when we do bad things and we have stuff happen to us that, as a result of that, that God can make things better. Now, that's joyous. I want to ask you guys about what you think, what's, what gives you joy? What makes you happy just in general? Come on, I know there's something. There's got to be something. Everybody has something that makes them joyful. Should I ask them out there what makes them joyful? Basketball. Playing basketball. Whenever you are playing basketball and you get the ball and you take a shot and whoosh, goes right through, does that make you happy? That feels pretty good, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, there's joy there. That's pretty cool. Closing your eyes, jump shot, one-handed. Yeah. Feels good, doesn't it? You guys, it does getting up and having it be all sunshiny outside and it's a day where you really don't have to really go anywhere or do anything. Does that make you happy? No. No? Oh, sleeping in. Yeah. Yeah, well, sometimes there's always, there, yeah, so sometimes there's things that just make us happy in life because life is pretty good, right? Like that jump shot swisher that, that goes right in the basket. Life is good. You got it on your hat. Sometimes we, like David, we go through some tough times and then God brings us joy after all of that gets resolved. And that's pretty good too. And today we're going to talk about joy 
that we can have even when things don't seem like they're ever going to get better. And you know what gives us that joy? Jesus. Because Jesus has something in store for us, like Jim was saying, that is so much bigger than all the problems that we may have here on earth. There is joy coming for the believer in Jesus, for the follower of Jesus, that is beyond anything that we can imagine. So we're going to encourage the adults to be joyful. You guys can be joyful too because there's some pretty good stuff in your life, right? (gasps) Yes. Amen to that. All right. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful things in our lives that bring us joy, the good meals and good company. We pray that you would return joy to us whenever we struggle and have difficulties, that you would bring us through the trial. And we thank you for the way that you've promised glorious rejoicing in heaven, uh, that we can be fully in your presence. And and that is an incomparable joy. We ask that you would inspire each of us to be joyful by watching these young people celebrate their lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks. three verses. <laughs> I have a song that Jesus gave me in the sand from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. There's a melody of love in my heart. There rings a melody. There rings a melody. Marta to play a little bit of this next song. I'm not sure that it's one that we're familiar with. Happiness is the Lord. It has some really good words in it. Happiness is a new creation. Jesus and me living in close relation. It has some good 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 words to it. So let's look at the words. We'll struggle a little bit with the music perhaps. And other than that, just sing with your heart. (laughs) We don't care if you hit the right note or not. (laughs) Happiness is to know the Savior, living a life within his faith.
good job. We're going to do that again I'm, another time. <laughs> okay. That is a good song, but I can't help but think a little of this passage from Philippians when we sing that. I'd like to invite you just to listen to these words from Paul's letter to the church there in Philippi. He closes, uh, this is the, the conclusion of the letter that he's writing, beginning in the fourth verse of that fourth chapter. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The things that we need, things that are important or useful to us, we keep those things close at hand. I want to ask for a little congregational participation here from y'all. How many of you have got a cell phone with you right now? Okay. Put your, keep, keep, everybody put them down real quick because they were kind of embarrassed that they have their cell phone with you. Have you got your cell phone with you? Raise your hand high there. Eh, quite a few of you have got a cell phone. Yes. Now, now would be a good time for you to check and make sure it's turned off. So everybody got that. Silence the cell phone. Now, a lot of you raised your hand. And to be clear, I don't want to attach any value to this. I'm not, this is not a, you know, a, there's no better or worse if you have or you don't have one. That's not the point today. The point is that a lot of us find these little devices to be pretty useful um, they're, they're, a lot of our lives get facilitated by them. We can take and receive calls. If you've got one of those ones that you can do texting or you can look things up on the internet and so forth, they're, they're useful, and so we, we usually keep them fairly close by. Uh, what good is having a cell phone if you, if you keep it in a box under the bed? It doesn't really serve a purpose if you do that. If you put it on a shelf and it just collects dust, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So for those of you who maybe didn't have a cell phone, I'll ask another one. How about a set of keys? How many of you got a set of keys with you right now? Yeah, there, most of us do. You know, we, we need to unlock things or lock them up. We need to maybe start a car to drive from here to there. So we've got keys. They're useful. They're important. We keep them on our person. Occasionally, we all we realize that we forgot our keys, and we've got to go back and get the keys because we need to have them with us. They're not much use on a shelf, are they? They're not much use if they're in the drawer at home uh, collecting dust, forgotten. So, there's something today, something close at hand, something at at arm's reach to everybody here today, and it's pretty important to us. It's the Bible. You all have access to a Bible today. Some of you brought your own Bible. It's in a translation that you like. It's all marked up in the way that you, you know, important passages, you're familiar with it. Some of you have got a whole collection of Bibles on the cell phone that you brought with us. You can pull up any translation that you could possibly imagine. It's there. And everybody's got one in the pew at arm's length. It's there. You can, you can use it. It's not very far away. It's close at hand. And this is because we as, as Christians, we consider the Bible to be important and useful. It's a big part of our lives. In the the words of the Church of the Brethren, we view it as our rule of faith and practice. That's a great phrase. I want you to hang on to that one today. It is our rule of faith and practice. It tells us what we need to know. It tells us how we're supposed to behave. And more significantly than that, we consider it to be the, the revealed word of God. That God said this. In this pages of this book, we encounter God's will for us. So more than just a collection of wise sayings, more than just useful teaching, more than just a history lesson or a a moral treatise, this book, this book is God's gift to God's people with God's character and God's will shining through on every page. So it's pretty important, right? It's pretty important It's certainly authoritative. 
We consider it our rule of faith and practice, and by all means, it's useful. And so we keep it close at hand. What we don't want to do is treat the Bible like a phone that we never answer or a key that we never turn in the lock. Having things close at hand doesn't always mean that we make full use of them. We may consider the Bible to be authoritative, but if that's just an ideological position, just an intellectual statement without any kind of real-world application, then what use is that? You can say whatever you want. If it doesn't get into practice, then it doesn't mean a whole lot. I might say that I believe in the principles of aerodynamics, but if I never get on a plane, what does it mean? Not much. Considering the Bible to be authoritative means that you're going to submit to its authority, the the authority of scriptures. And I want to be clear, you're not submitting to the book, you're not submitting to the Bible itself, but to the one that inspired the Bible. If we believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is who God is, and then we're going to recognize the authority of God as it comes to us through this word of God, what God has said Now, I understand there's going to be plenty of ways for us to hear the Word of God. There's enough diversity even in orthodox understandings to have a conversation that will go on for centuries. But ultimately, if we believe that God is who God is, then we will recognize that what God says, what God has revealed to us in the Scriptures, is important. That we need to listen to it. That it should have some controlling, some guiding authority in how we live our lives. If you call yourself a believer, a follower of Jesus, a child of God, then this book is going to mean something to you, something important. It really does become your rule of faith and practice. And to the best of your ability and with the strength of the Spirit, you're going to do what it says, right? So, I didn't say I have anybody go, well, I'm going to get out of here. I don't believe that. You're all still here, so we're going to assume that we've established the significance of scriptures, right, for the, for the Christian. And if we do, we're probably going to start thinking, well, we might have a different viewpoint on this concept of joy. Because the scriptures are certainly that. They are a record of joy. Last week, we started this short series on Christian joy, and last week we noted that joy, it's not always right there in front of us. It's not always as present and as we'd like it to be. It can be elusive, particularly when the circumstances and the situations that we face, they seem so bad, bleak, depressing, and that happens in life. All the way from the macro scale, the worldwide calamities that are happening, to the very personal, intimate struggles and trials that we encounter, it would be easy for us to lose sight of joy. Like the children of Israel we talked about last week, uh, taken captive, forcefully relocated to Babylon. How can we sing the Lord's song? How can we be joyful when we're experiencing all of this? Last week we talked about the possibility of considering the, the, really the, the, the essentialness of considering Christianity as a particular and a unique religion of joy. And today we're going to examine some of the evidence of that, what the, what the scriptures tell us about that. If Christian, Christianity, if it is a religion of joy, and if this Bible is authoritative, our, our rule of faith and practice for the Christian, then we must be able to find A record of joy in the scriptures. And as it turns out, it does not disappoint. The scriptures have it. So, joy. Joy is a a rich concept. And it's nuanced. It's a lot of different stuff in there in the Bible. Simply turning to your concordance and finding the word joy and looking it up, it's not going to give you the full picture. There's so much more there than that. The theologian Marianne Thompson, in a collection of essays, this on joy and flourishing. She divides the biblical references to joy into, into three different groups, three categories. I want to follow her lead. It's a pretty good way to kind of categorize, break these things down and get them in our heads. I want to begin with the most simple, the joy that we experience because of the good things in life. Now, I know some of you are like going, what good? You know, it's, it's tough. There's things, you know, it's like, This morning we went around and we talked about everybody's plumbing problems because there is, you know, sprinkler problems and there's water problems and there's stuff broken and leaky washing machines and it's like, okay, yeah, it's hard to have joy when your washing machine is is not working right. 
But the reality is that there is so much in life that is good, just genuinely good. That puritanical stereotype of Christianity as that dour, hangdog kind of ascetic religion is all about giving, giving up any sort of fun or enjoyment in life. That's not based in Scripture. That's not what we find there. Sure, there are some Christians that are that way. That, are, that, that kind of, oh boy. And, and there are certainly things that the world enjoys, and I'll put that in air quotes, that we need to challenge, that we need to question. But the Scriptures are clear that the people of God, they're allowed They're even encouraged to find joy in the day-to-day experiences, the celebrations of life. Thompson points out the rightful, joyous response to a good word in Proverbs 12, 25, to wise children in Proverbs 15, 20, to being reunited with family in Exodus 4, 14. These are all good things. How many of you have had a really good meal at any time in your life not just recently at any time where you're like going oh that was so good have joy in that celebrate that the harvest time the springtime the 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 green fields have joy in that the sun the rain the scriptures talk about having joy in the coronation of the king the celebrations the seasons the festivals all of these things should be uh, should be responded to with joy They're a source of joy. All such occasions and objects are good things, she writes. And in such times or in response to such occasions, people are glad. This is what the scriptures tell us. Even the rest of creation, not just the human parts of creation, the rest of creation, the Psalms are rich with this, this symbolism of of all that God has created, all of nature, praising God. Reacting with joy, Psalm 19 is a wonderful one. It talks about how the heavens declare the glory of God and how God has has set the sun to run its course of the day like a strong man running its race with joy. These are joyous images and all of creation celebrates. But we don't always live there, right? As we've all experienced, not every part of life not every moment in life stimulates a joyous response we do have leaky washing machines at times and things that are even worse than that there is often pain and suffering that's encountered in our lives when we're going through difficulty we come to this second kind of joy that thompson talks about the bible speaks of the potential joy that comes in that situation It's joy that comes when adversity is overcome, when things are set right in our lives. In Psalm 30, David speaks of this kind of joy. He says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is what we're talking about. This is the the same heart, the same sentiment that we heard from that reading earlier that Jim shared with us from Psalm 51. David, and I told, we mentioned this, he, he was in trouble. This is not one of those psalms where David is all happy and jumping around. He is genuinely repentant in this psalm. He has done some bad things and not cheat on his taxes bad. He actually had Uriah sent to the front of the battle so that he would be killed so that he could claim Uriah's wife Bathsheba as his own. This is bad stuff. And you remember the story that Nathan the prophet tells him. He talks about this this poor shepherd who has one lamb that he, he cares so much about and his rich neighbor steals the lamb from him so he can have a dinner and, and David says, I'll set this right. Who is this guy? And Nathan goes, it's you. And that's where we get this 51st Psalm. This is David at at, at the depths of his guilt and his shame over his behavior, crying out to God. He recognizes his sin. He recognizes his transgression. He accepts the rightful and the righteous consequence of that sin. And he cries out to the Lord, purge me, cleanse me, wash me. He cries, I need to be clean because I'm not And he says, let the bones that you have crushed 
find joy. Let them rejoice. I'm in pain, yet that's not all there is to life. There is still hope. What David is talking about, what many of the prophets talked about in the First Testament, what they pointed to is that there is often a consequence to our choices, and that is hard, but we are not doomed to live in that pain forever. There is hope that God will once again bring joy into our lives. Now, Both of these forms, these first two of biblical joy, they're rooted in our lived experience. We've all sensed this in some way or another. We've all experienced this. There is that joy that wells up within us as we celebrate the goodness of life. You walk out and smell the flowers. Maybe some of you have allergies, so you're not getting that. But uh, see, look at the flowers. They're beautiful. The green grass, the way things are bursting into life, there is that joy. There's beautiful sunrises and sunsets. There's trees, the sound of waves crashing on the shore and birds singing. There's the smell of rain on dry ground. Have you ever gotten that one? Man, that's good. There's babies taking their first step. Oh, what joy. There's the first word, and then after that, it's running around, and what they won't be quiet. But that first one, oh, that's great. Good friends, good food, there are countless little blessings that, we, that, that simply being human entitles us to, that God says, yep, you get this, and it's good. These are the kind of things that the Bible tells us to enjoy, to celebrate, because they're all signs of God's love, how much God loves us. And, and while there's also pain in life, there's also suffering and bad things in the world, There's also the joy that comes when those things are finally behind us, when we've moved through those things onto something better. It's that that positive diagnosis after the the, the fear and uncertainty of an illness. It's the, the reconciled relationship that comes after a period of distance and mistrust. It's the debt that's finally paid off. It's the reunion of of, of people that have been apart. It's the restoration of things that were broken. This is joy that comes as we move through the pain and into something better. As David found out in this 51st Psalm, it's the repentance followed by the joy of God's salvation. Thompson calls both of these kinds of joy, joys because of. You have joy because of this. It is joy experienced in response to a circumstance, a situation, either a circumstance that is inherently joyful, something wonderful in life, as in the first type of joy, or the joy that we feel when the the, the natural pain and suffering of life are relieved and we're freed from a difficult situation, the joy that comes in the morning after a long night. But there's a third form of joy that we find in the Scriptures This is the hopeful joy that that Paul is talking about here in Philippians. This is a joy that's not dependent on circumstances. Instead of it being joy because of the joy that's characterized by the first two types of joy, this is joy in spite of. It's a joy that's found even in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the darkness, which would be a strange joy. An odd thing, if it weren't for that bigger world, that that more broad perspective that Jim was alluding to this morning, that the Christian inhabits a world of eternal, spiritual significance. In the close to his letter to the Philippians, Paul includes that phrase. I read it twice today. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now, the first part, rejoice in the Lord, I get that. That's... That makes sense. Rejoice in the Lord. Of course, the Lord is going to stimulate a joyous response. That's, that's, who, that's who Jesus is. It's what Jesus is all about, replacing mourning with celebration. Uh, Jesus is the resurrection, not the grave. This is joyous stuff. And yes, oh yes, recognizing Jesus, accepting Jesus, that is joyful. So rejoice in the Lord, that's fine. I understand that. It's that second part. The part that he adds on there that I, that I stumble over, that always part. What's Paul talking about here? Well, before we dig into it, we've got to take a little closer look at this letter that Paul's writing. Philippians, Philippians is a letter that is full of joy. 
People talk about it as a, a, a letter full of thanksgiving, and there certainly is plenty of gratitude that you find in Philippians, but it has a lot of joy in it too. Philippi was one of Paul's favorite churches, one of the dearest congregations to him. He had a lot of good feeling towards the Philippians, uh, this little congregation there in Macedonia. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, another letter that he writes, Paul is talking to the church there in Corinth about this collection that he's, that he's heading up, trying to gather some support for the Christians in Jerusalem. They're kind of down, down on their luck down there. And he tells the Corinthians about all these churches up in Macedonia, probably most significantly Philippi, and about their severe trial and their extreme poverty. Those are quotes. And we don't know the particulars about what was going on there, but this congregation of Philippi seems to have been having some, some tough times. They weren't doing really well, at least as far as the external factors are concerned. Severe trials, extreme poverty. And that could have been an, op an opportunity for them to get down and depressed and kind of in a funk about things, to struggle and grumble and complain about things. But we see from Paul's account to the Corinthians that these conditions didn't result in that. They didn't result in depression or, or funkiness, but in a rich generosity. In fact, Paul even he seems to indicate that it was because of the trials, because of the extreme poverty, that the generosity became evident. And at the close of the, this very letter, Paul's letter to the Philippians, we see that generosity on full display again. And this time it was for Paul himself. Verse 15, he talks about how of all the churches, it was the Philippians alone who joined with him in materially supporting his ministry. So the generosity of the Philippians is not in question. They, they display that in space, but generosity and joy don't always go together. I mean, you may imagine some generous people who aren't very happy people. <laughs> they're, they're generous for whatever reason, but it's not a, it's not a natural connection there. And we know that the Philippians were in distress. There was something going on there that was not good for them, with materially certainly, but maybe more than that. Maybe persecution was happening. Maybe there were spiritual challenges. Because this is what Paul wants to give them when he writes them this letter, encouragement. And he's not just telling them, you know, I know it's bad, but hang in there. Just hang in there. Things are going to, you know, I hope anyway, things are going to work out all right. You know, you'll get through it. Joy will come in the morning. He's saying, be joyful now now right now rejoice in the lord do it always don't look at the circumstance and say you're going to put joy on hold rejoice now in verse 17 and 18 of the second chapter he says that that even though he himself paul is being poured out as an offering uh, in essence giving his life he will rejoice and he calls on the Philippians to rejoice with him. Now, the joy that Paul's talking about here is not that joy because of that's dependent on circumstances. This is joy in spite of. Joy that is possible for the Christian regardless of the circumstances. And I'll say this. It is a joy that is uniquely available to the Christian. Because the follower of Jesus is somebody, is supposed to be somebody who's aware of this broader perspective, this greater reality than what the circumstances seem to present. You see, there's a thread that ties together all three types of joy found in Scripture. This thread is the recognition that all joy finds its origin in God. That's it. All joy finds its origin in God. The first type, you know, the one that we were talking about, the humanity and all creation rejoice because of all the good stuff in the world. Well, they're not rejoicing because of anything special about them, about anything good or cool or noteworthy that they did. They rejoice because it's what God does. God provides this. You remember that passage from Psalm 19 that we talked about? The way the heavens are telling of the glory of God. This is the glory of God that they're talking about. Not their own glory. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. What creation is doing is recognizing the goodness of God and praising God for it. 
the joy of creation, even the human parts of creation, flows from the benevolence of God. God does this stuff. God does these wonders, and we are joyful because of it. And this is a profoundly biblical concept. God is worthy of praise, and God's gifts are a source of human joy. So that first kind of joy, the joy because of the gifts of God, that joy obviously originates in God. The second kind of joy, the joy that comes in the morning, the one after that long darkness, also originates in God. Because who carries us through this stuff? God does. What's David saying in that 51st Psalm? That his joy is a result of what God is doing, God's cleansing activity, that the joy is of God's salvation. It comes from the restoration, the clean heart that God gives him. Now, in David's case, he was definitely suffering as a result of his transgressions. The pain that he was experiencing was was certainly a punishment. But once David returned to God, God was ready to restore David and return him to a joyous state, one that he could rejoice in. And when the difficulty is not a result of sin, but simply because we live in an imperfect world, a fallen world, we can still find joy, joy from God, originating in God's benevolence when that light dawns in the morning. Oh, hallelujah for that. God brings us through, and that is a cause for rejoicing. But that third joy, that third joy, the joy in spite of difficulty, that is a special joy. One that can only find its source in God. It is a uniquely Christian joy because everybody, you know, everybody, believer, unbeliever alike, everybody can experience joy because of. That's universal. Everybody encounters something good in life at some point, whether we recognize it as God's gift or not. We all have, on occasion, joy in the morning Uh, once in a while, but not everybody sees God's deliverance through it. But to have joy in those unrelenting trials of life, to have joy when there is no indication whatsoever that that difficulty is going to let up, to rejoice always is something that only a Christian can reasonably do. And it's because that we know that God is the ultimate source of that joy, the ultimate origin of that joy, both the joy because of and the joy in spite of. See, this this is the hope that we are focused on as Christians, the hope that the Scriptures reveal to us, this eternal hope, the promise of the ultimate reconciliation of all things, This is the new heaven and the new earth that we're talking about. This is the glory of God's presence we're talking about. This is leaving that darkened and obscured understanding of God behind and finally being with God face to face. That is joyous and that is where we are headed, believers, as followers of Jesus. It's what Jesus made possible with his death and what God began with the resurrection of his son. See, this is the joy of knowing that this troublesome, pain-riddled existence, even with all of the countless joys because of that that we experience, it's not all there is. It's not the beginning and the end. That there is more infinitely more, more love to experience, more peace to savor, more wholeness to embody. And it's all because of God. You want a reason to rejoice? There it is. So the scriptures, this wonderful gift that we've received they are a record of joy because they are a revelation of God God revealed to us and because God loves us so much and because God wants the best for us they can't help but be a record of joy there can't help but be joy on every page even the tough stuff even the difficult passages that make us go oh man I got a what 
Even those things that call us to repentance, that point out our failures, that demand that we reflect on the consequences of our choices, even those pages are undergirded with the potential for joy. Because every one of those things is for our good. It calls us to restoration, calls us to reconciliation. And what could be more joyous than receiving that gift of restored relationship with God? So the Bible is all about finding the lost and having a party. So long as the lost are being found, so long as the prodigal is coming home, there is joy. And as long as we hope for that glorious eternity, that glorious future with our loving Lord, then joy is all there is in front of us. All we have to look forward to, everything that we are headed towards is joy and celebration and wonder. And how do I know this? Because the Bible told me so. Let's pray. God, your love for us overwhelms us. We we hide from it. It's so much sometimes. We can't express our gratitude appropriately is so full. And Lord, we struggle and we stumble and we have difficulty. But you will bring us through. You have promised good things, things that we can enjoy in this moment and celebrate because they are inherently good You have promised us that you will carry us through the difficulties in our lives and that you have a great and glorious future in store for us. And in all this, we know that we have cause to rejoice because of you, because of your glorious grace and the gifts that you give us. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, help us to see more clearly every day the celebration that you have in store. Carry us through the difficult times in our lives, the pain and the suffering. Help us to understand that joy will come in the morning, and if that morning dawns in a new and glorious form, we look forward to it. We long for it. Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we enter into this joy. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, that's a good song. Bible verse that pastor's preaching on. <clears throat> God brought that verse to me when um, my mom was first diagnosed that she was terminal with cancer. And I was devastated. I was nine months pregnant and didn't want the baby to be affected by me being too upset, you know. And that verse just stood out. It just jumped out. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And don't forget to thank him for what he gives you. And the very end... And he will give you peace in your heart and in your mind. Does anybody else ever have it? It's my mind that gets going in the middle of the night. And I can't, all these things, all these problems, they just keep going. But he gives us peace in our hearts and in our minds. So I, don't, I wasn't planning to say any of that. <laughs> Do you ever find that you're just going about your business, doing your thing, and all of a sudden you realize you have a song kind of playing around in your head somewhere. Maybe it's coming out. I don't know. I apparently have a song that when I hit the kitchen, I whistle. And I whistle that song. And Gary says, oh, yeah, here she goes again. It's the same song, and I can't even remember what it is. It just pops out in me every so often. 
Well, I want to plant a song in your mind tonight, today, right now, so that this week you will go along in your daily doings and this song will just keep reverberating through your mind. Just keep playing over and over. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Let's stand and sing our joy and our peace. <clears throat> you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There will be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The field of the field will clap your hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Well, you again. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. You looked out for joy and all the trees of the field clap, will clap their hands. Oh, one more time. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There will be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field that will clap their hands. All right. <laughs> Bow with me once again. Lord, we ask your blessing on these, your people. We ask that you would give them joyous hearts and understanding of your great love that encompasses and fills and lifts us through our lives. We ask that you would keep them safe in all that they do. Give them opportunities to share that love and that joy with those that they encounter and bring us together again soon so that we may praise and worship you again. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may go with joy.